Welcome back. This is video two of a three part series called Is Everyone Here? Strategies for Finding Complete English Families. I'm Jana Greenouch and I'm excited to be sharing this video as part of the ICAP Gen Track of Classes being offered for Roots Tech Connect. In video one, I introduced the idea and the importance of seeking complete families. And we talked about looking for the gaps in the children of a family and asking questions about what might have happened there. In this video, I want to talk about two of my very favorite England record types, censuses and civil registration records, and how we can use them both to find and complete English families in the 18 and 1900s. England censuses listed every person living in the house on census night, starting in 1841, and we get one every 10 years after that, uh, until the 1930s and 40s. To get a good picture of a family, you need to find them in every census they appear in. I hope you already know this, but one census is just never good enough. Your goal as a thorough genealogist is to find your research family in every census they were alive for. And, and don't forget that children may be working away from home, apprentices or, or teens or young adults working as servants away from their parents. Find them too. So I use a chart, something like this. This is a simple one, just a, a checklist to help me keep track of what I'm looking for. And I have a notes column to identify what I know about why they may be missing from some census years. If I know someone passed away, I have a range of years that I won't be looking for them, obviously, and I use color on my charts to show when each child leaves home. Those are blue. And you can see from a chart like this how important it is to locate families in every census, because if I only ever looked at this hypothetical family in 1861, for example, I would only know about five of their seven children. Now, of course, you can't assume that this is everyone since babies may have died in between census years, but if you're researching a family that was alive at all after 1841, be sure to find all of their census entries. And this is a great starting place for our goal to find complete families. This is foundational and it will save you time in the other more complicated records. This is always my first step for every research family in the 19th and 20th century is to find them in every census. And then the very next step will be to use civil registration and church records, christenings and burials to fill the holes to mind the gaps, but we'll get to that later. Now, keep in mind, families are not always typical and they don't always look the same in censuses. There's some interesting things to watch for. So let's look at an example. Here's a young family in Liverpool on the 1841 census. We have Robert McCowan or McCowan and his wife, Elizabeth. It's, it's lucky that we know she's his wife since they don't actually uh, specify that on the 1841 census, but they happen to here in this entry there in the occupation column, she's listed as the wife. And there are two little daughters, we assume. Anne and Elizabeth may or may not be their children, but most likely they are their daughters uh, who are noted here to be 18 months and three months old. By the way, if you're not aware, the 1841 census in England is unique in that they rounded ages down to the nearest five for adults. So we know that Robert and his wife are somewhere in between 20 and 25 years old since they're both listed as 20. Now, here's the family 10 years later in 1851. Elizabeth McGowan is now listed as the head of the household, but she's married, not a widow. That's unique. Daughter Elizabeth is missing from the census, but there's the other daughter from 10 years ago, Anne, with a more full name, Anne Jane. And two new children, Rachel and Joseph, ages five and two. I have some major questions looking at this. First of all, where is dad 
why is Robert not at home if his wife is still listed as married to him instead of being widowed? And their daughter, Elizabeth, where is she? Did she die within the last 10 years? And that's why we don't see her here. She would have been only about 10 years old at this point. It's a little early to be living away from home. It's possible. I tried to search for both of these people, Dad and Elizabeth, in the census, living other places, and I couldn't find any good options for them in the indexes. In fact, I couldn't find anyone from this entire family in any later censuses, 1861, 1871. The answer I found in my research ended up being immigration. This family left to the United States. So I had to move my searches west for those later decades in the censuses of the United States. Turns out Robert had immigrated earlier than the rest of the family to find work and earn money to pay for everyone else's passage. Uh, so he wasn't here in 1851, but they were still here. And the daughter, Elizabeth, wasn't with them even after they immigrated. Civil registration had to answer that question for me, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, sad end of the story, just in case you're curious. Robert ended up passing away before his family even arrived. So those later U.S. censuses taught me about Elizabeth's second husband and the children she had after remarrying in the United States. Before we leave censuses, let me add that I've, I've cropped off the address and occupation and birthplace information in these images just to make it easier to read, but that is all very useful information for making sure that you're, you're following the right family from one census year to the next. Also, let me just offer a couple of census tips for those of you who are researching more recent families. Don't forget to search the 1939 register. It's available at Ancestry and uh, Find My Past. It's really very similar to a census, and it could possibly help you to find more children from a family. And one of the very best tools for finding complete families uh, a little later on is the 1911 census. This census included a remarkable set of columns which asked how many children a woman had in her current marriage, including how many were still alive in 1911 and how many had died by then. Very helpful. You can stop searching in the gaps if you've managed to find enough children to add up to that total, at least up to 1911. All right, let's take a look at another wonderful record type, civil registration. We'll go back to the Robert and Elizabeth McCowan family to demonstrate this. And please note that their name is spelled differently in almost every record I find them in. Spelling variations are the reality, and you need to keep that in mind when you're searching for children in a family. If you'll remember, we found a total of four children for this couple using the 1841 and 51 censuses, Anne Jane and Elizabeth. Rachel and Joseph. Because these births occurred after 1837, the beginning of birth and death registrations in England, we can use civil registration records to help us more solidly identify when they were born, and we can also use civil registration records to help us look for other children that this couple may have had. I definitely see some gaps between these children where there were likely to be other kids. Uh, for some basics about how to use these records, please see my Roots Tech Connect video called English Civil Registration Records. It's part of the Records Analysis video series sponsored by ICAPGen. For now, I'll just give you a quick example of how I search for the McCowan children in civil registration. So you can find English civil registration indexes in a lot of places, including Ancestry, uh, Free BMD is very popular, many other websites. But I prefer to search the indexes directly on the GRO website. And you can do that for birth and death indexes. You have to create an account, but it's free to search the indexes. And the benefit to doing that here is that you get a little more information in the indexes than any of the other sites. Here's what the birth search form looks like. 
you're limited to searching a five-year window. So pick a year and plus or minus two years to do that. And you also have to search the female and male indexes separately. So it can be a little tedious, but it's, it's worth it in this index because what you can do is simply put the family's name in the surname field, add the mother's maiden name, if you know it. I happen to know Elizabeth's maiden name was Skellington. And then it should find any children that family had during that five-year window that you're searching. And because spelling variations are the reality, you can tell it to search for variations, which I really appreciate. You can search by district if you know exactly where the family lived, and that can help you narrow things down. Another wonderful benefit to using the indexes on the GRO website is that when you search for deaths, you can see exactly how old the child was. And this helps us to know more confidently whether we have the right entry. There were a handful of Elizabeth McCowans who died in the Liverpool district between the 1841 and 51 censuses. But we can see clearly which one is ours, because only one was the right age at death to match the little girl we had seen on the 1841 census. And then of course, if, you, if you'd like even more detail and absolute proof of that, then you can pay and order the death and birth certificates themselves. So for the McCowan family using just the civil registration indexes, two additional children were found, Robert and Thomas. We also learn that Robert and Thomas died as babies. And just like we suspected, Elizabeth died as well as a two-year-old. It was just lucky that she happened to appear on that 1841 census, wasn't it? Especially because I couldn't find her anywhere in the civil registration birth indexes. Sometimes entries are hard to find because names were mistranscribed or maybe they just skipped her birth registration. Who knows? If any of you, my viewers, finds her in the birth indexes, please let me know. I could not find Elizabeth. We also gained some uh, more solid birth years for the other children by using the indexes because they tell us which quarter of which year the child's birth was registered. So we can narrow it down to about a three month window. I still have an unexplained gap of four years between Rachel and Joseph, so I will continue searching in various records. This is a work in progress, but six kids is more than four. Now, before I wrap up this video, let me point out a nice tool for you family search users out there. The family search tree has some very smart helpers, behind the scenes programmers, who are training the computer to do some of this work for us. I looked up the Robert and Elizabeth McCowan family in the tree, and over on the side of the page, I saw these notes. It was almost as if Elizabeth was speaking to me and saying, hey, don't forget to look closely. There are some gaps in my family. Go find my kids. These were the notes that inspired me to do some of this research that I demonstrated in this session. So go check them out for your family. To summarize the main points of this video, Censuses and civil registration records are very valuable record types as we seek to fill in the gaps and research complete English families. Creating a chart or a table as you research families in all the census years that they were alive for is a good idea. Using the birth and death indexes on the GRO website is a great way to find missing children of a family and to refine the dates that they were born and died. The mother's maiden name feature is particularly helpful there, so play with that. Of course, censuses and civil registration records, they're only helpful when you're researching families from the 18 and 1900s. So in the final video of this series, video three, I'm going to discuss using church records and probate records, which fortunately reach much earlier than the census and civil registration records. So I will see you there.